Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 640, that's 640 of the Agostino Zynga show, that's 640 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast has found you, I hope you are doing well. How am I? All things good, all things good considering what's going on out there in the world, all things good. The last few pods, I've been sharing some of my struggles and I find it really interesting how quickly people relate to struggles and hardships that they're going through and want to offer support, words of encouragement and stuff. It's actually quite nice to see that happening in social media, to see that happening online, to see that happening out there in the world right now because we all believe it to be callous, to be cold and to be cruel out there. But it is nice to have people that don't know you personally reach out and say, hey, I've also gone through something that difficult or I'm currently going through something quite difficult. I know how you feel. I'm with you, brother, etc., etc. But it also is a little bit sad to know that there are so many people out there also suffering in silence. who don't have the kind of the outlet that I have. I wouldn't even call it a platform, but the outlet I have to kind of share my issues and to connect with people from around the world and kind of, you know, have some level of support these people don't have it and they have to kind of just suffer on their own which you know is his own type of hell but i guess in one way it also is a great way to kind of um harden you and to toughen you up and to get you to the point where where you're ready for the world and nothing that you come across is really going to throw you off your dean i mean you're still going to be on thing so i can definitely understand the positives of it but i was just thinking about it today a little bit more because I stumbled across this really interesting clip of 50 Cent talking on Twitter. And he shared some very interesting insights regarding mental health and regarding depression and stuff that I've long held, but obviously not being as successful and rich and as famous as 50 Cent, I can't share these things without getting shouted on social media. And considering the current climate we're in, where everybody is kind of turned into a self-diagnosed mental health um you know advocate or no self-diagnosed mental health person in some way shape or form and everyone's kind of advocating for it in some way shape or form you kind of feel a little bit weird it kind of you kind of feel a little bit mean if you come out and say a lot of people that are claiming to have mental health issues are just trying to do it for attention or they try to do it to excuse their lack of motivation or their lack of drive or whatever it may be called but in general i'm not even going to go that far my whole issue with the whole mental health issue at the moment now is more so that it doesn't necessarily really speak to the main issue at hand which is most of the time when you're really coming up and you're actually struggling or you come up from a real difficult background or you have many things you're juggling at the same time as you're pursuing your dreams the fact that you're having to do those things to pursue your dreams is what needs to be addressed like how can we create society or you know live in a society where jobs for the most part are fulfilling to the point where you don't need to have two of them you don't need to have an additional side gig you don't need to be working until ungodly hours in order for you to have some money in your pocket you can do x y and z it can support your basic needs and on top of that you can do all the extra stuff that you want in order to pursue your dreams that should be the main takeaway from it but we don't live in that sort of society but i thought 50 cents views on mental health in general i thought were really interesting this is a from a clip taken from big boy interview did on 92. Free FM. So I'm going to play it now and you can hear what he has to say. I think the things you go through make you who you are. Mm-hmm. And in my journey, like there's certain things that I, I'm not really, I don't even let it into my system like that. Like, if, like I think depression is a luxury. Wow. Because where I'm from, you can't afford to be depressed. You got to pay the bill, right? Right. So you got to go to work. You got to get up. You got to go do what you got to do. You might don't. They got people right now that's at work don't feel like being there. Mm-hmm. But they got responsibilities, so they yes, go. Sir. They feel uncomfortable while they're working. Why they doing what they got to do? Like and at, when these guys get in a, in a slump and they just decide that they're not gonna do anything. I'm like, where they do that at? Right. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even when you're on the street, you got a pet. You just decide not to come outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> th- and don't get me wrong. I don't agree fully with what he's saying. And I have to be honest, I think the fact that I grew up like that and the fact that I have that kind of outlook on mental health is probably quite damaging and toxic in itself. And I've known from the times, the issues I've had, you know, connecting with people, the issues I've had with kind of making friends or maintaining friendships 
has sometimes come from my inability to maybe empathize em, 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 empathize here yeah, empathize or emote or connect to people on that sort of level and one of the real kind of telltale signs i see of it in myself is sometimes i did have a tendency i sometimes do some i sometimes do it now but i've tried to kind of put it to one side and kind of cut it down a bit and chill but i do remember having a tendency to order to always try and fix issues and problems in a very pragmatic rational logical way i would never just let somebody just rant and rave and kind of cry and get emotional and complain and whine and moan about whatever issue they had there was always a really sensible common sense solution in my head i thought that could solve all their issues they didn't need to complain about it anymore I've got the answers and I could continually walk around with that sort of ego, with that sort of hubris, um, with that sort of, you know, self-talk, with that sort of weird um, confidence that everything I'm saying is somehow going to solve everyone's issues and everyone's coming to me for all of their answers. And I'm not really addressing or kind of figuring out or understanding the emotional, mental side of things that's affecting people or maybe kind of reading between the lines and actually seeing what that person's actually saying without them actually saying it kind of thing and i never really actually kind of figured out how to really make that work particularly well and of course like i said before that probably speaks to my inability to form long-term lasting social connections with people and friends and stuff because i tend to kind of you know as, as soon as i'm around people who i feel like are complaining too much or get a bit too whingy which is most people i tend to just kind of back away shut myself off and kind of keep myself to myself because i feel like in my head oh they're not on my level all this sort of nonsense stuff that you know is clearly toxic and and clearly destructive and clearly not helpful in any way shape or form but i also feel like this refusal to kind of use mental health as an excuse or depression as an excuse for the position i'm in or for the inability for me to achieve the things i want to achieve has also been a blessing because if anything it's kind of allowed me to keep on trucking to keep on putting one foot in front of the other despite all the clear and sometimes obvious signs that maybe things aren't going the way that I want them to go. It's quite nice to have that mental fortitude to know that if you just keep going, if you just keep waking up and keep kind of putting one foot in front of the other, you will eventually get there without kind of entertaining that self-talk of like, what's the point? This doesn't mean anything. Is this really for you? Uh, look at him. Look at her. It's like, no, 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 no. I just have my kind of, I just have my, um, what do you call it? I just have my blinkers on and I just keep on trucking on. Like similar to Brendan Shaw, but I just go. I just go, I just go, I just go. And I'll figure it out sometime along the way. But I guess it is a luxury to have that kind of way and perspective. It probably is a bit of a curse in itself as well. Because again, like I said, it doesn't allow me to guard, lift, to lower my guard and to be like a regular, regular, regular Joe out there and kind of really kind of open up in that kind of way but hey we are kind of made where we are in it we are kind of made the way we are then i quickly went to mention this regarding nini h launching her label which is going to be called ume with an ep from bashka so it's a non-for-profit outlet which will platform artists from unrepresented backgrounds. I think this is pretty cool considering what Nini H went through with the possession. She went through a bit of an issue with them in terms of her. I think they held some license or something to an old track or maybe her catalog or they hadn't paid her. But it was really unpleasant to go through and to see it happen in real time because if I remember correctly, a lot of Nini H's early buzz from what I remember, again, from the outside looking in, I'm pretty sure she was doing her bits on the ground level, wherever she's from. I think she's from Berlin, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure she was doing her bits over there. But from what I remember seeing, from being just a general punter from around the way, or from out of the way, sorry, I remember her kind of blowing up off the back of the possession parties in Paris, where they're doing these random kind of warehousey type events, playing that kind of hard, fast techno sort of stuff during the midst of the pandemic. And of course, I saw her playing on whore, that online um you know live streaming platform in berlin that they have that's essentially the german version of boiler room or the berlin version of boiler room and i think those are the two places that i remember kind of seeing her face seeing how she played seeing her style and whatnot and of course recent interview um recently with playful magazine um which i sorry is it playful yes playful magazine which i definitely recommend you check out if you haven't already they've got a really good channel on youtube as well where they do interviews with djs and whatnot so it's quite cool to see her kind of you know be able to um come back from that heartbreak come back from that setback and sort of rewrite the wrongs and also kind of show and prove what she would like to see 
in terms of a label, right? In terms of going through a difficult situation with a record label, you go through a different situation, difficult situation with a booking manager, a booking agent, whatever it may be called. Instead of whining and complaining about it, you go out there and you kind of try and reset those issues and try and provide something different so that the people coming, you know, after you, not even beneath your generation, but people coming after you have something else that they can kind of grab onto. They don't have to go through the same pitfalls or have the same, face some of the same hardships you have to if they don't have to. You know what I mean? It continues here. Nina Hage is launching a label, Ume, with an EP from Munich-based artist Bashka. Out on February the 15th, MacTube Mac spans five vocal-driven techno cuts and features a Nini H remix. The EP, the EP sorry, is an idiosyncratic um, love letter to myself, my heritage and my community. Bashka said, my songs reflect the expedition of the past year and half up until now and all the emotions I gave myself space and fought you to deal with and also to relish in. That sounds very tasty. A not for profit outlet, Ume will platform artists, unrepresented backgrounds such as QTBIPOC artists, god damn, and those from the Swana region. Swana region. It will also share revenue with artists on the roster and promises an open critique of toxic industry standards, crude label politics, and the dominant music industry business model. So again, this is all woke. This is all a bit lefty, a little bit cringy, a little bit yuck. But they are putting their money where their mouth is, you know, kind of showing and proving. And that's a great thing about little niches, about underground scenes, about subcultures. You can try these little utopian, um, ideologically possessed projects and see if they work. Because really and truly, you're not really doing it for to blow for the main masses or the or the you know the normies out there obviously that'd be um, you know amazing but you're mostly doing it to kind of feed your base and to kind of speak to the choir so why not actually put out some good messaging out there and hope that maybe some of the residual effects from this will be some little kind of industry changes you never know and who knows if you're lucky it may also kind of seep into the mainstream um consciousness you know nothing's off the table but i do like this approach i'm not going to lie even though you know it's a bit like you know trigger happy with the terms and stuff but we continue last may nini h called out prison label position for withholding payment for a 2021 ep as i mentioned called beast describing the experience as extremely disheartening via instagram petition responded with an online apology conceding that it's important to not to exploit music producers we exploited her but it's not important not to exploit her um since then nini h has released an ep on live from earth club and contributed to a fast forward charity compilation which raised money for a community-based fund launched for the club um i think it's it's called like 41 something but it's got a sign um listen to bashka's d4 here i'm not going to play it because i'm probably going to get copyright strike but you can see the cover there it looks pretty sick for uh, five tracks track one act bad then you got default azaz consequence of calamities and you got default featuring the nini h remix there which is pretty nice this whole possession thing was actually funny also if you think about it like i think for the majority of the issues happening in dance music it is quite funny when you see all the issues especially when it considers especially when it kind of applies to people within the what you call it q t b i p o c community the l g b t q community the queer community it's quite interesting when you see the people that are usually scamming them the people that are usually scamming them people that are usually you know doing all these really crappy horrible things like essay and r word are usually people within their own community it's never the bros and the chads that they worry about when they turn away those guys at the door i'm sure you know they're not going to be good matches for the people over there right i'm imagining your typical michael bibby crowd probably won't mold too well or blend too well with the guys and the girls and the days and the dems who go to a nini h party but still i find it very very interesting how usually the people who are the quickest and the first to scam you are the ones that are nearest and dearest to you, which is always the case, right? It's always the case like that. It's always people that look like you're actually the ones you should be more worried about as opposed to the big, bad, you know, um, scary person out there who you're not really that sure about. But I'm glad to see her bounce back. I'm glad to see her kind of put her best foot forward and show and prove and actually set an example as to what she wants to see in a label the not-for-profit um, aspect of it is really interesting also to see how that works how do you manage and function and operate a record label maybe it's just like an outlet we just put stuff up on the soundcloud or maybe you have a deal with some production companies i don't really know how it works but regardless i'm curious to see how this does work in the real world out there and hopefully it pops off and becomes a model that people can follow going forward one can only hope 
Then we also have news courtesy of RA regarding London Junction 2 Festival confirming their first name as they return to Boston Blood Club Manor. I'm still annoyed at Junction 2 for moving location in the first place because of whatever nonsense they had to move it to. I still maintain that first Junction 2 festival that I went to. Was it 2020? Was it 2021? Who knows? But it was absolutely banging. It might be one of the best London outdoor festivals I went to. And primarily, the reason why it was so good was because of the sound. I've been to plenty London festivals, I've been to plenty UK festivals, and I'm sure most of you out there can attest, if you're from the UK, have come to festivals here, you will know the sound is notoriously bad because of local council complaints and because of where these parks are situated and whatnot, they just always have to limit the sound and it becomes really, really, really bothersome if you're there for the music and you're there for the sound, you're there to kind of vibe out, to kind of go somewhere like that, like in open field, and you can't hear the music unless you get right up into the right up until the front of the stage which kind of defeats the whole point of going to a per going to a park and going to a festival and having it being you know open air and whatever, whatever it may be so you can be whatever you need to be and you have to kind of stand right at the front like an absolute dalad um waiting to hear the beats flip and hit your earlobe so it's nice to see london junction 2 kind of confirm the boston manor names and hopefully the names you know from last time come back again but you know let's wait and see it says, after several cancellations and a change of location, the LWE event will return to its original Boston Manor Park on July 21st 22nd, and July 22nd of 2023. On the Friday on the stage, hosted by um, Ion, uh, what's Ion again? Is that the headphone brand or something? I forgot. Um, Junction 2 Sister Festival in Albania. Oh no, that's it. It's the festival in Albania, my bad. Um, the lineup will feature the likes of Underworld, who will play live, Jeff Mills, Midland, Orla, Otik, back to back with Ben UFO, Helena Half is a pretty good person to see there daphne honey dj stingray object elka and sophie cortesis not gonna lie so far that lineup isn't really pushing me to go the only people who i legitimately would want to see in that sort of festival lineup um don't get me wrong as much as i love jeff mills and he's a legend i don't want to see him in a park i want to see him in a really dark nightclub somewhere so that's probably a, a miss um i probably don't want to see ben ufo because you know who who cares i, I like him but you know um, Helena Half, I'd like to see, of course. Honey would be sick to see there in that sort of um, platform. And that will be about it. And maybe DJ Stingray, yeah, for just the nostalgia sort of things. But they're not really hitting off the way you would have wanted it to hit off. It continues. Saturday's lineup features a stage hosted by London platform performer Fuse. What? Which will host um, he what? Hessel Audio. So Benny Fuse playing twice alongside Paniga and Pearson Sound, of course. Uh, you got Sama Abdulahid, you got Fiak, Margaret Degas. Jesus Christ, that's really old school, isn't it? That's minimal to, to the point. Margaret Degas and Sonia Mina. Whoa. And Adam Bayer. What? Yo, I'm not going to lie, Junction 2. I love you guys, and that festival is nice outside in the park. But this lineup sounds like absolute doo doo. Next year, Junction 2 Festival will be the first since 2019. Okay, cool. That's the one I went to then. In 2022, the festival had come to move dates and location due to COVID-19 related delays. And a few months later, it was forced to cancel altogether. Yeah, I was happy it did cancel. I got some time off of work from it. I was happy I was able to, you know, get that canceled and get that refunded and put my money towards other events. But those lineups seem really, really horrific. Actually, they mentioned names here they should have actually mentioned that are pretty decent to go check out on a Saturday. I see here Dax J. I see DJ Holographic. Um, I see Genie on Earth back to back with Ghost. These names are much better than the ones that flipping RA picked out. RA don't have good taste, bro. Like, honestly, Dax J, DJ Holographic, I'd see. Um, Genie on Earth back to back with the Ghost would be some of the best house music you've ever heard. Um, and a disco, indie dance type of vibe um and that's about it nina kravitz if you're on that kind of vibe but look but um pralesh rarish versus sorry rarish and back to back with prasella is going to be absolutely banging yo man they really really scummed the flipping lineup so for me i would say saturday is definitely better than friday but you for back to back with helena health wow so loads of back to backs and i guess that's the theme of the festival back to back ben ufo helena health definitely back to back with honey um, Dixon playing on his own, DJ Stingray. See, the lineup's decent, but is it worth the, 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 the price of admission? How much are they charging for this blood club? Let me see. Because I'm interested to see if this is true. Du, 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 du. How much are they charging for this? Let's go on a Friday. And let's see what the prices are saying. 
Um, have they got the price listed? No, not yet. Okay, so tickets aren't on sale just yet. I guess it's got to register your interest and all that sort of malarkey. But yeah, fair enough. Ticket page of 20 pages. Okay, I guess if you want to and you kind of, you know, you don't mind putting out a pre-order or whatever it may be, it might not be the worst idea in the world to kind of put it down because, like I said, the lineup on those other days are it's way better than whatever, you know, RA picked out here in their little um, report. But still... Considering what's going to be available this year and this summer, it might be best to kind of hold off and kind of see what your options are going forward. But like I said, if Boston, if they return to Boston Manor and it's returned to the same levels that I saw when I went there in 2019, it's going to be banging. Legit. The sound was so good. It was well organized. Um, the stage underneath the flipping motorway was absolutely sensational, like to see visually, because if I'm not mistaken, it was a bit, it was like on a bit of a hill. So you actually got to see the stage all the way from the back if you wanted to. So those bare people just standing around, um, around the back. And I actually saw a, a, a way nicer mix of people because I think there is a tendency for London festivals, depending on what sort of genre you're in, to be really young or to be really all over the place but i thought this one was a good mix of like having young people older people chin strokers shufflers cat boys coke boys balloon girls um weed girls like you know everyone was kind of mixed in and i think it kind of added to the overall vibe of it and maybe it was the fact that the lineup is so usually eclectic and all over the place because i think to myself i would never imagine to see a lineup with genie on earth the ghost and dax j do you know what i mean and flipping enzo siragusa who's you know a shadow of his former self but still i would never uh, you know expect to see those kind of lamps together so clearly they are going for a little bit more of an eclectic you know um varied uh sort of lineups and hopefully that will kind of serve them well going forward but like i said it might be best to kind of hold off on buying your ticket straight away to go and kind of things just in case there is better options out there going forward oh yeah and in other news here some actual important news some actual monumental news considering how obsessed I am with Berkine and some of you guys actually might have heard me speak about it on the podcast before that Ostergut their in-house booking agency has kind of kind of gone by the wayside and at the time when it happened or the news was confirmed a lot of people were speculating that maybe it was the beginning of the end of Berkine and things were changing but from what I've been able to surmise online it was more so to do with you know one of the owners or one of the original founders of Berkine leaving and whoever's left now behind and whoever's in charge and whoever's investing in it has now got a different idea and a vision of where they want Berkine to be steered towards and I guess having a booking agency wasn't something that they thought would be beneficial going forward but it wasn't really an indication of how poorly Bergheim was doing as a business from what I've been hearing that's just my side of things or maybe I'm wrong but that's what I've heard but it is quite encouraging to see this news courtesy of Ben Clock, who's one of the residents over there at Bergheim that he's launching his own uh, booking agency to kind of pick up some of the guys who have been left without representation from Bergheim and he's labeled it Circle this is courtesy of his Instagram account, as you can see here, me begging with the bookmark and the like on there, double interaction, double engagement, double sense of desperation and sucking off the, off the teeth of Blaine Cock, asking him without asking him desperately to sign me to his booking agency so that I can also go on tour and play all these illustrious clubs all around Europe and the rest of the world clearly clearly from the c from the five thousand plus people who have liked that post he will see my post see me djing at fucking pirate studios paying what 37 pounds for a three hour set uploading that crappy grainy footage to my flipping youtube channel and he'd be like you know what i need this guy to play alongside me i need this guy to come into my agency i'm gonna put my arm around this big burly black dude shoulders and get him into the scene that's the hope in it that's the hope anyway this is the caption curse your bank clock he says a new year a new beginning now that osgood booking comes to an end i would like to this is my my german accent i would like to thank my agency for over 15 years the incredible journey is unfolded moving forward i'm excited to start my own project circle booking together with my longtime agent alexandra 666 She's actually Christian, not, not Satanism. Um, a small selection of artists, some old friends, some fresh talents. Let's see where the journey takes us. Keep an eye on Circle Booking if you would like to be updated. 
And of course, they've got the name there. And then I think the next page, I think I featured. Yeah, there we go. That's the Instagram profile of Circle Booking. Now, if I was being one of those rah, rah, rah people on social media, I'd be saying, it's whitewashed. There's no representation. Where's the diversity, Ben Clock? This is not representative of the scene. But because I want to get on the agency myself, I'm going to keep my spicy takes to myself. And I'm just going to say what an incredible roster of very talented DJs who all should be on the roster of their agency and who all are some of the bright, shining lights of this industry and are going to take things forward to the next level going forward. Clearly, just imagine my face on this roster as well. Like, imagine, right? So I'm, I'm there on the roster. Right, no, because no one there smiling. I think um, what's her name? Stephanie Sykes has got a little bit of a grin, little bit. Boris maybe has a tiny bit of like a. Mm, you're not coming into my house, and then um, Ben Clock maybe has a little bit one as well. But no one smiled at that in this picture. <laughs> maybe it would work. Maybe it wouldn't. But yeah, big up Ben Clock anyway for starting his own artist booking booking agency. To be honest, I'm not too sure how these things work. Um, I'm not too sure if they actually do contribute to your overall success as a DJ. I'd imagine they would do, especially with somebody like a Ben Clock and considering his connection with Bergheim and the things that he's done himself as in the DJ career and whatnot. I'm sure those kind of recommendations go a long way. Um, I'm not too sure how much business comes through these sort of pages and whatnot or how it actually functions altogether, what the rates are. Do they take a 10% cut? Is it 50? Is it 20? Is it 30? Is it pro rata? Who knows? Is it Cash App, ZL, um, you know, PayPal? Who knows? But congratulations to everybody on the roster. They've all got home now. And going forward, I hope they all get mad bookings. This dude here in the middle, Pablo Bose, has definitely been one of my greatest discoveries in the last couple of years. Also, this guy is an absolute savage behind the decks. If you like that synth pop, I tell a disco, uh, indie dance type of vibe, definitely check him out. But he's actually quite versatile. I think if you check out his uh, boiler room, I think. It's quite a good, um, ex, you know, a representation of maybe if you'd catch him at a random rave, what he might play. But I had the pleasure of seeing him play at the flipping, um, at the Sylvester in Bergheim in June, I think, or June, July-ish um, in the double X or sorry, the triple X room. And it was absolutely banging. I had a, such a great time. So I definitely recommend you check that guy out if you haven't already. And of course, you know, if you want something more eclectic and a little bit out, out there in terms of the song selections, Sorry, definitely check out Boris, also a mainstay over there at Bergheim, who's always tearing it down. And definitely an underappreciated DJ in general. Maybe because he's more of a bit of a meme or whatever, but in terms of people, you know, um, sucking up people like Freddie K, I think Boris should definitely get just about his love. Maybe because he doesn't travel as much. I don't know if, he, if that's the case. I don't see him in a lot of kind of international lineups. Maybe that's the case, but overall... These two guys, Boris and Freddie, sorry, I mean, Boris and uh, Pablo Buzzi are definitely two of my favorites that I've kind of stumbled across in the last two years or so. And of course, Face Face Tower, a few others, you know, whatever, maybe. But let's move on from that one. Let's move on from that one. Then I wanted to touch upon this, which is quite interesting. This is courtesy of Matthew Williams' Instagram account. He did a little Ox Me Anything um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it may be. So I took a screenshot of it where he was answering questions from fans and whatnot. And I thought this answer to him, um, you know, answering the question of what would be his favorite Jordan, you know, model to kind of collaborate on was really interesting and refreshing and original. And also... You know, a little bit questionable considering the stuff that he's made going forward. But I thought this was quite cool. So somebody asked him here, would you ever design some Jordans? And if so, which one? And he said, the Jordan 8 Low. Interesting, right? I would like to make these. I was born in Chicago and Michael Jordan was one of my biggest inspirations as a kid. I love Jordan brand. Maybe if we all say we want this shoe to exist and share this image enough, it will get made one day. So I guess the picture he's sharing up above is actually his own interpretation of a Jordan 8 low, which in my opinion might be one of the worst Jordans ever because I think a lot of Jordans, with the exception of maybe 11s or something, many Jordans don't really look good once they've cut into lows. You think of the Jordan 1 being a classic example, you cut those bad boys into lows and they look like 
legitimately like they ran out of material it just looks horrendous looks horrifying the icon of most jordan models is the fact that they are kind of knee height sometimes just above sorry not knee height <laughs> i'm joking they're not flipping ricardo tc air force ones they're sort of like ankle height just above the ankle but when it comes to having actual low sneakers like running shoes and make those to be basketball trainers i'm not a fan of them similar to the nowadays you get a lot of these basketball um you know sneakers that are made with these new gen stars i think the new ones did the, the the jam around ones there a lot of them are kind of you know shoes that you would describe as kind of regular sneakers and i'm assuming most of them have quite um interesting or dynamic outsoles and grip that kind of alleviate or can kind of uh, replicate any sort of um, security or protection you might have got from the shoe kind of covering your ankle and kind of centering you that way maybe that's the kind of thinking behind it but regardless of the design principles the technology the innovation behind it i just hate all jordan lows i think with the exception like i said of 11s i think i don't think any jordan looks good in a low i think they all look terrible but for whatever reason and Matthew Williams, I think maybe because, you know, just to be a little bit different and to kind of, you know, stand out from the rest, he's gone for a model that I think is also underrepresented and doesn't get enough respect in terms of the Jordan lineage, in terms of the Jordan 8. The regular Jordan 8s are definitely one of my favorites, you know, similar to that, the Jordan 6s and 7s, either side, they really go pretty well. But the 8s are really good because I think the colorways are banging. you got the aqua colorway, you got the number one, I saw like a YE ready colorway that's kind of like a fire one. So they kind of, you know, I like that kind of classic 80s, 90s kind of, you know, um, color scheme where it's like two or three, four colors, nothing too crazy. I love the little addition of this little um, pattern here that reminds me just above the um, the back of the heel that reminds you of the section that they have on the Etic Challengers. Like it reminds me of those old kind of basketball, sorry, the basketball, uh, tennis court shoes that Nike used to make back in the day or those kind of cross trainers where they'd have like a little um, panel that you could make, you know, you could add little patterns on it and whatnot that maybe match some of your lycra that you're wearing or just kind of throw a little bit of an extra detail going forward on them. But from what we can see here, this Jordan 8 looks like maybe a mock-up that he maybe was putting together um, in, t in hopes of getting made with Jordan brand or something that they actually worked on, but it got scrapped and never actually got done because from the picture itself, it looks like a picture that you would have seen on the Alix site, even the font of the Jordan 1, Jordan 8, Jordan 8 Low. You've got the mock-up of the shoe. If you look closely, it does look like it's been put together in Photoshop or maybe it's been rendered or something. I'm not really too sure, but maybe it does exist, a version of this in real life or there's a couple PSD files out there floating around. But I did think it was a really interesting and creative approach to Jordan brands because, you know, most people out there, they will just go for the typical kind of Jordan 1, Jordan 4s and whatnot and kind of trudge out the same old nonsense and it gets very boring very quickly. And, you know, with the plethora of flipping Jordan 1s out there, sometimes because that model has been, you know, you know, rinsed into the ground and beat like a dead horse, even though it's one of the greatest base models of all time, you can easily mess it up if you start to do too much or if you think you're too clever and you want to kind of present a new kind of um, idea behind it and use it as a canvas, it can go really crazy or really left really quickly. And there's also opportunity to, to rewrite things, narratives, and to rewrite kind of appeals. Because look at the Jordan 2. I remember when Vashti did a collaboration with the Jordan 2 back in the day. I think it might be one of the first women ever to do a collaboration with Jordan Brand. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't her fault because I think that original retro, the actual model itself was doo-doo. Like Nike didn't spend a lot of money in retooling, in kind of, you know, um, trying to rebuild that original Jordan 2 silhouette from the ground up. So by the time Virgil did his Jordan 1, or again, that's another good example of another Jordan that's a good in a low. When he did his Jordan 2 in a low, it was really good because they actually based that model off of the old school vintage pairs. That's why they had all the crackling on it and make it look like it's been kind of, you know, um, sitting in storage for a while. But the, act the actual base model, the, f the form of it, the silhouette, the shape was all of it. The tooling was based on the original shoe, kind of built from the ground up, kind of similar to what Adidas were doing with Stan Smith 80s and campuses and superstars way back when, when they were getting kind of re-retroed and kind of pushed back to sneakerheads and whatnot. So that's a pretty good kind of adage to go by. So I'm, I'm curious to see if this actually picks up any steam, if this goes anywhere. I've got to give credit to Matthew Williams for choosing something a little bit out there and not going for the same old tired models, Jordan 1, Jordan 3, Jordan 4, Jordan 6, 
you know, whatever it may be. He's kind of going for stuff a little bit out there to kind of, you know, carve a little bit of a niche for himself going forward. Do, do they really fit the elite's aesthetic overall? Probably not. But I still think it's a good, tasteful approach or something. Um, if anything, I think most of his Nike collabs, outside of the ones that he does, where they're kind of the running esque ones that look like you know stuff that something that you'd wear you'd wear in the streets of Tokyo or something. The other ones, when it comes to the Air Force Ones and um, what was I thinking about? Yeah, just the Air Force Ones for the most part. I like that he has two approaches that he could take. He can really take the maximalist, futuristic approach with the other shoes he has. I forgot what the name of it, the kind of running shoe ones that he does. But they're not really, no, they're not, they're not Elites actually. They're, they are his own thing. I'm mistaken. So I think he's got two collaborations. He's got the M, what is it? M, uh, MW and Nike, which is basically his kind of fitness, functional performance type of stuff that he does because you know he's a kind of a, an amazing creative and you know super rich playboy bachelor guy who does burpees and kettlebell swings in his amazing prison mansion so of course he's got to be decked out in the flyest gear so when he's pumping himself on a flipping you know illico machines and whatnot and rogue you know pulling himself up on rogue flipping um pull-up bars it's nice to have those kind of really futuristic pairs of shoes to kind of set you apart from everybody else out there but then he also has the ability to do like relaxed casual lifestyle type of shoes and not go too crazy with them like even the air force ones are really tastefully done i feel like the material upgrade was cool and then the little addition of the roller coaster buckle type thing hardware on the strap was also really awesome even though it probably didn't sit too right and it probably weighed heavy on the strap and made it look dainty and floppy over time i still think the approach is really good in terms of trying to you know keep the air force one high basic and just try and adopt those really classic colorways of like white and black black and white the colors that you'd maybe see you know made popular or famous on like sneaker catalogs and magazines so you should read back in the day so i thought that was pretty cool so let's see how that goes man and where this takes him i do like, like i said before it's a fresh approach it's something interesting it's something to really kind of you know bother about and to kind of pay attention to and who knows he may do what virtue did with the jordan 2 he may do what you know union did later with the jordan 2 and actually make the jordan 8 low a thing where people actually want to wear it similar to what even travis scott did with the jordan with the jordan 1 low even though i still think the jordan 1 low is a horrendous shoe travis scott kind of you know made them cool or made them somewhat relevant again even though people were usually buying jordan 1 lows as a kind of a cope or as a consolation prize if they didn't get the actual jordan one they wanted similar to how people buy jordan 1 mids instead of just buying the highs because you know you're not going to leave here with nothing, right? As Denzel Wonsigen would say, right? I'm going to leave you with something. So I definitely understand that vibe. But yeah, big up Matthew Williams in general. Um, that looks pretty cool. Eager to see if Nike or Jordan Brand do end up picking this up and going forward because I like to see other colorways because I think the black would look pretty cool. But like I said, I can't be wearing Jordan 8 lows. I just can't, man. Just not my vibe. Hate them all. I think they look terrible in my opinion. But hey, what do I know? Then I'm going to touch upon this is courtesy of Kicks on Fire regarding the latest on this Air Jordan 3 white cement reimagined. So it looks like Jordan Brand are going full tail on this reimagined stuff that they're doing. They already did it recently with the Jordan 1 Chicago's, um, which were what you got lost and found, sorry, which are reimagined where they kind of essentially aged them artificially by adding crinkled leather cracked leather by dyeing or you know kind of staining the midsole to make them look like they're in storage um, for ages and whatnot um adding some white bits of foam and chalk or whatnot underneath the shoe also you know having laces that were maybe sail and not pure white and then i think the last thing was having this fake receipt the store receipt of a shop that they originally purchased the shoes from which is again a little bit of a slap in the face because you could be argued that Nike single-handedly ended pop, you know, mom and pop stores because of their kind of very heavy-handed approach to merchandising and stock allocation, and you know who gets tears or who doesn't get whatever, and you know whatever maybe or sales, all that sort of stuff was a bit crazy back in the day. So you know, yeah, I could, you know, I'd imagine if you're a store, you saw that you'd be a little bit peeved. But also, I'm a little bit peeved because I feel like this reimagined stuff is really annoying because it's only done to service sneakerheads it's not going to service anybody else i don't think you're a regular smegging the person down the street who's buying sneakers just to, for their attention i think of somebody like the aiden ross those kind of young kids they're just buying the latest and greatest because it's rare it's sparkly and it's going to get them attention but they're not actually buying sneakers for the love of sneaker culture you know like most of us are because you know we're the flipping dullards and they're the flipping big pop stars and superstars out there 
but for the most part you're buying them because of that right so you so for, sorry, for the most part they're obviously being appealed to sneakerheads so i don't know why nike or Air Jordan brand in general, if there is the case that these are going to appeal to Jordan brand, why don't they invest more into actually making this shoe look like the original? Like instead of just having the midsole be a little bit stained, like you added a tea bag on it and maybe bits of the upper and cracking on some leather bits and whatnot and the off-white laces, why not just actually do something from the ground up and actually take a vintage shoe, which there are plenty. They can't say they don't have them. They could buy them off of people. They could loan on people's collections. It's not hard to get hold of, but they just don't. So if they would do that, it would be sick because what they could do is that they could take a Jordan 3 from like the 90s, 80s, whatever it may be, and absolutely reverse engineer it, like break it down to its key components and try and rebuild it in a contemporary era, similar to what, again, Adidas did before with the whole, you know, Stan Smith's and Jordan, sorry, Stan Smith's and um, Campus 80s and S, you know, superstar, Adidas superstars, all those type of things. They went a long way in terms of, um, really sort of setting the standard of what retros could be and myself being a long time Nike fan and being a sneakhead for ages and ages I still remember how much pain I felt when Nike reissued the Nike Air Max Lite and the original t couple of colorways that we saw coming from like you know JD Sports whatever were horrendous that like they legitimately bastardized and ruined a really iconic Air Max Lite because they couldn't be bothered to grab the original and try to reverse engineer it and for me when I see pictures like this online like this um, account here called MJ023 um, Dan where they basically bought a pair of what looks like Jordan 4 Firebreds, the original, original, original version from the 80s, and they posted it up on their Instagram, and obviously Instagram is going Google Gaga for them, because they're flipping amazing, the colors are vibrant, the shape is the main thing for me that really, really throws me off. Apart from the colors, apart from the clear, obvious quality of material, even on the finish, you can just tell this thing is going to last forever. It's more so the way he asks the question as well but yeah I, I don't know i look at these type of things and i'm like to myself like there was a time when i was buying sneakers or in sneaker culture deep in forums where i remember where they would you know jordan brand or nike or whoever the powers that be at those retro places would kind of hold over people's heads stuff like the nike sign on the back of the hill tab right of a jordan 4 or a jordan 3 and stuff it'd be a big deal it kind of lured it over us and we, for the longest time they made us believe that it was a licensing thing or something like that where Jordan Brand and Nike couldn't be seen on the same shoe, something dumb and obviously we didn't care, we chuckled and we kept it moving but I remember this being an actual thing in the forums I was in that hey, Jordan Brand are thinking about putting the Nike logo on the back of the hill tab, it was like an absolute big debate, people were going out first to try and buy theirs and saying the hill tab is on so it's really interesting and strange to see them go to you know to some lengths to rewrite the wrongs and other lengths they just don't care about or they don't want to address in any kind of meaningful way because so far what i've seen definitely 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 steers in the direction of just like a regular jordan free with some dye you know added to it but not anything special from what i can see anyway but hey what do i know what do i know and look at how good these jordan fours look look at them the shape even even though they're cracked up and they look completely moldy and manky the shape of them is so much better than the jordan threes that they hold up a lot more than those jordan threes you saw earlier it's absolutely crazy how much they hold up on there but yeah what can you do what can you do so as most of you guys will know louis vuitton have been struggling or have been really desperately trying their darndest to fill the enormous boots that virgil left behind when he unfortunately passed away um, a year ago and from what i remember of the conversation online because it was a little bit weird that a lot of the conversation around his successor was coming so soon after his passing then of course some people did the respectful thing and kind of reined it in and stopped speculating which was nice so people could actually mourn his death for one minute and not just you know use it as an opportunity to claim clickbait or whatnot whatever they were doing but over time, things have kind of hastened to the point where they're now probably looking for a long-term successor to kind of take the brand forward now that maybe they've run out of designs from Virgil's kind of, you know, sketchbook or ideas um, that they can kind of work from and kind of take to the next level. So now they're trying to, you know, move things forward a little bit. And I remember when the news first came out about it, there were many, many amazing names being linked to it. Um, people like Martin Rose, Grace Wells Bonner, and a few other people. And it looked like they were steering in the direction of like, okay, we're going to keep it black. 
because these are marginalized unrepresented um you know talents in that industry who clearly have the ability to create on a higher level. Look at someone like Martin Rose, the stuff she's done with Demlin and Bled Circle. It doesn't need to be spoken about too much. And obviously Grace Ward Bonner has obviously shown a lot of aptitude and a lot of talent and a lot of promise early so, so far in her short career and a few other people. Clearly there's a lot of talent there that if given a bigger platform is definitely going to show and prove. And we're like, okay, cool. That's pretty decent. Let's go forward. And even when they come out, uh, out lately or recently with the whole idea about, oh, it's going to be a creative team around it. And then we heard, Ib, you know, um, Ib Kamara is going to take over. He was kind of helping with the styling before Virgil passed away and kind of really helped to kind of tie things together and make it look really amazing and striking and worthwhile and intellectual and fashion with a capital F with his styling, you know, attention to detail and eye and whatnot. That was all good as well because, you know, there's a lot of good sentiment around Ib Kamara. They clearly had a decent working relationship before he passed away and there's one person who could carry the torch, maybe it'll be him. But then it's now being switched and turned all the way around again and out of the blue, out of absolutely nowhere, right, out of absolutely nowhere, what's his name? Um, Jess Jules' former fiancé. That's the only reason why I know this guy, who he is. This is legitimately, you know, my only recollection of the guy. Apart from that, here everyone talking about how nice he is as a person. But apart from knowing that he's a nice guy, I also know him to be Yes Jules' partner. Because I remember there was a period of time where they were dating and quite serious for a while, I think. And he was the partner that she never kind of mentioned. But, you know, if you knew, you kind of knew. And it says here, super, super surprise. Why Louis Vuitton chose Kid Super to co-create the next menswear collection. I think it's an absolutely terrible choice personally for me. Again, I got nothing against the guy's designs. I'm sure he does stuff pretty well. But considering the names that I've mentioned before, this is completely underwhelming. This is underwhelming to the nth degree that this is the person they they in fact decided to choose and to go forward with. And if anything, if anything, if you really think about it, really think about it with the pragmatic, rational, non-emotional point of view, and as much as I love and adore Virgil and what he did at Louis Vuitton, if you really want to extrapolate and pull yourself away from it and actually think of it from a business point of view and from a taste and presentation and fashion and expression and creativity point of view, why not just completely divert or completely take a left turn or a right turn and go a different direction and hire somebody with a completely different vision that maybe isn't as streetwear based, that maybe isn't as casual, that maybe isn't as bright that maybe isn't as expressive in that kind of way that he did it that maybe isn't quite as multidisciplinary and just have something really different like an absolute opposite of what Virgil is just to kind of reset the palette and to reset the tone reset the house whatever it may be so push something out different so that we can kind of close that chapter for for lack of a better term because if this is what you're going to try to spin and use as, oh, this is Virgil's legacy that he's kind of laid forth, you know, the creative, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, a creative flipping um, team of people designing with Kid Super leading the charge and we're going to change the person every single... It's like, no, it's a mess. It's too much. And it's really surprising because really and truly, the people that operate at LVMH, you know, the real high-level people... They are killers. They're sharks. They're really savvy um, businessmen and women. You'd assume they'd have their finger on the pulse and know what to do because they've done this many different times in many different industries where a charismatic, you know, charming, influential, uh, popular figurehead, you know, gets disposed or unfortunately passes away and you have to kind of, you know, bring somebody else up. Usually just having somebody that kind of just is a regen with a different skin tone is maybe not the right way to go about things especially if the work isn't as good and they're maybe not as well known you just take a left turn and kind of gamble with somebody who's got maybe a different vision a different view of things so that you can kind of restart things and kind of go in a whole new direction that's what you'd hope it would happen but again what do i know i'm just a you know a little dusty guy here living in the middle of stratford talking out my asshole but let's continue with the article featured on vogue it says kid super founder colin colm dylan Colm Delane. Is that how you say his name? Colm Delane. I didn't even know that was his name, actually. My bad. I thought his name was Kid Super. Anyway, it continues. With just two Paris Fashion Week shows under his belt, it's a return next week of a remarkable new gig at Louis Vuitton, the world's largest luxury house. The Louis Vuitton Autumn Winter 2023 Menswear Collection, which will be presented on the 19th of January, was created by the men's studio with the participation of Dylan. In other words... Home is embedded into the men's studio, the house set on Tuesday. The show will also feature scenography from Lynn. So how do you say her name? Lena 
Kutu Vot Kut Kaya. Lena Kutsovkaya and French directors Michel and Oliver Gondry, who directed a prelude film for the show and expect an appearance from yet to be discussed world famous music star. This is budget uh, sprite version of Flipping Virgil, and I don't like it. Um, I saw one of the kids' shows, super shows, where he had a painting and people were bursting out of the painting and wearing the items that felt very art attacky. I'm not going to lie, it felt like I was watching Art Attack. And people were kind of whacking themselves off of it and going crazy off of it. But I remember when Sammy Ross did something similar with a cold wall back in the day when he had his ballerinas and expressive dancers coming out of cubes and turning into stuff and going into clothes. People are saying he was doing too much and trying too hard. You know what I mean? So I don't know, man. I'm not feeling this. I'm not going to lie. I'm not feeling this. I think the kids' designs suck. Um, personally, I don't like them in the slightest. I know Russ loves the clothes that he makes, and I don't look at Russ as a style god. I think he's an amazing business mind, and of course, entrepreneur and whatnot. Um, you know, he's advocating for ownership in music industry, but I'm not looking at that guy for style. I'm not looking for Kid Super to kind of set any trends in that way. Like I said, it's just underwhelming in the names. They really did honey dick us. They made it seem as if they were kind of trying to reset the palette by having somebody black, but obviously somebody with a different, you know, um, taste and different kind of idea, creativity, or a different presentation level of what they want to do with Louis Vuitton. You think of someone like Martin Rose or Grace Well Bonner, they're definitely going to present something different, but at least they're black. At least they're going to be different voices, different faces at the end of that runway who maybe present a different idea of Louis Vuitton, but this is just for me trash in the empty degree it continues um according to the and i wonder who the world famous music star is going to be is it going to be fucking ray schmurder or something like if it's going to be that you can miss me with that shit according to the house this marks the continuation of the talent con collective concept already seen in the last two seasons following the death of urge Ablo, the house's mentor mentor director um could could Sov Kaya was a longtime collaborator of Ablo, as was Ib Kamara, who will be behind the styling of the up and coming shows. Like I said, there's too much of all this stuff. Just break away and choose somebody properly, or just let the people that are doing it before just continue on and let them evolve over time. But this kind of multidisciplinary stuff, like it's given Lacoste, it's given Calvin Klein, it's given directionless, it's given no ideas. Like, what is this? This is this is nothing. You're just by choosing this they choose to do nothing which are, i guess in one way they're trying to appease the crowd and appease the fans in some way shape or form but i don't like this in the slightest i think this is horrendous so why is louis vuitton elected dylan it says as follows sorry delane is it delane or dylan delane i'm assuming it appears that this season's collaborative format, which through his embedded cameo role effectively makes Delane its first ever guest runway designer, has been planned to act as a placeholder. Oh, okay. So they haven't selected or figured out who they want long term. So instead of just pausing things, they're just going to plug this guy in and keep producing, you know, whatever it may be. Couldn't Ib Kamara have done this? Like, really and truly. Couldn't he have done this? Like, would they have needed to come? So what? They're going to have three chefs in the kitchen. They're going to have Ib Kamara. They're going to have this um, Kutsev, Kutsev Koya lady. They're going to have um, this guy, Dilane. And who else Who else is going to be in charge of it? There's too many cooks in the kitchen already, it feels like to me. But again, what do I know? It continues. Ever since the sudden death of Ablo in November 2021, the house has been carefully considering the sensitive question of who might replace him, a huge arts given Ablo's generational impact and influence. Many names, including Delanes, have been have been what have been smooted. I never heard of this guy's name linked to the, with the Louis Vuitton job until they mentioned it right here. I'm not going to lie. He would have never been a name on my list in the slightest. I would have gone for flipping Kiko, who absolutely hated Virgil, right? But at least he would have been a more fresh, new, artistic, creative, forward-thinking, you know, idea or person to have gone with as opposed to this Delane guy. Because if you give it to Delane, you might as well give it to Mike and Mary. Like, well, what are we doing here? Like, what are we doing here? However, by handling the task of headlining its menswear output, only temporary to Delane, um... It, de it deflates that pressure while simultaneously affording the company time to align and execute the future plans to creative strategy and possibly eventual appointment of a long-term successor to Ablo. It doesn't do any of that, if anything. If anything, it just adds more pressure because if this guy's presentations or collections going forward are duds, then people are just going to look at it and just, you know, what a waste of time, what a waste of resources, what a waste of money. 
you know, you know, so much for flipping um, sustainability, and then suddenly you're getting someone else new to reset everything again. What's the point? All this time they had to ch- to select somebody, they didn't do it, they didn't pick because they can't make a decision because there's no easy ready-made person to pluck out there. That's what that's what also makes me think these ideas of picking people like Virgil and Matthew Williams to do Javon Shee and stuff. As amazing as they are for someone like myself being a streetwear kid and being a fan of the scene and how, you know, um, kind of genre defining and, you know, um, kind of influential they're going to be and motivational they're going to be for the kids coming up. And, you know, it means a lot to us coming up as well from that kind of scene and whatnot. If you actually think about it, it's the easiest decision in the world to make because those guys are the ones that are covered all over the main platforms like Hypebeast and whatnot. They're the ones that all the kids follow on social media. They're the ones connected to all the big and popping people on social like artists and whatnot and creatives and whatnot, right? They're, they're out there doing the thing on the field and putting up numbers and being, you know, um, noteworthy and being somebody that people think have a lot of clout and influence and blah, blah, blah. So picking those people to lead your company isn't that hard of a decision to make, really. It's not that difficult. If Aaron Preston keeps doing what he's doing with his brand and Nicky building, I could see him getting selected for a house. Would it be a surprise? Not really, because he's an obvious big choice to pick out of all those guys that came out of the, you know, out of the flipping umbrella of Kanye and Virgil and whatnot. It makes sense to pick someone like him. But the actual hard decision to make is who you pick after the fact or who you pick outside of those people who are the bait clouty names. I can't even think of somebody like a Tremaine Emery with what he's doing at Dead and Tears and whatnot going forward. I can even see him getting a big job at a fashion house sometime soon if he wanted to. And clearly, that would be an easy decision to make considering his connection with Virgil, his connection with Kanye, his stuff he's doing with you know Supreme, the other stuff he does himself, blah, 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 blah. But when they actually you know, have to make an absolute informed, critical, important, div- you know, um, uh, divisive decision, guess what happens? They put a placeholder in place and essentially they kind of throw this guy under the bus because, you know, come on, brother. I'm seeing some of his pictures here from his show from spring 2023. If this is what we have to see on the runway for fucking Louis Vuitton, I'm already, I'm already pissed. Um, it says here, LVMH owned Louis Vuitton is the world's largest luxury house. Its sales surged 20% to 20.6 billion in 2022 and are expected to reach 21.9 billion in 2023. This is without a quote unquote leader in the men's division, according to HSBC estimates. Menswear may not represent the bulk of the business. Okay, I take that back. But the role of the men's artistic director is given the size of the house and the importance of leather goods would represent over 10% of the house's sales, according to analysts and the halo effect of the men's design creative vision of the overall brand's desirability so clearly that menswear director role has a lot of cachet and influence in the overall sales of louis vuitton louis vuitton but i don't see what this guy from was he from la or whatnot is gonna do i really don't i'm not gonna lie i don't i don't really see what he's gonna do there um today's news is only the last latest twist in the designer um, who possesses an uncanny talent for manifesting a, a, that apparently impossible delaying created kid super money care 15 year old high schooler who with his friends had a side job printing street shirts so what is this like giving bobby hundreds the role of flipping what um creative director of flipping chanel or something like what well, one for this in his early 20s he informally founded the house from a from a ramshackle teal painted brooklyn apartment um that he shared with his fellow creatives in order to record music and shoot videos in 2018 he formalized the marquee he says the idea of the young um this young person who believes in anything is possible and is the basis of kids super said delane during a past interview with vogue runway and it pushes you to be better understanding that maybe nothing is too far-fetched yo this is too woo woo and motivational speaking as well to be honest for me i don't like this there was no one asking me to come to paris fashion week that very much seemed far-fetched but when i spoke to my friends about it i kind of just jokingly to say i think the next step might be paris fashion week everyone believed i could do it because it's this alter ego of kid super where everything is possible you shoot for the stars as old brendan would say you shoot for the moon you aim for the stars um late in 2019 delaying's application to join the official schedule was approved 
by the Federation de la Haute Couture et de la Mode. Um, his acceptance letter featured the opening dress of the first show, the February 2020, a series of compelling digital presentations followed during the pandemic period by which Delane had caught the eye of MH Prize global talent identification operation. Bruv, if he puts out LVMH NFTs, I'm done. I, this smells like crypto, innit? This smells like crypto. Maybe I'm hating, but this smells crypto y. Abloh was among the judges who awarded Delane the 150,000 cardiographer prize in 2021, accepting it that day. Delane joked that before the mentorship with LDMH that comes, the prize that began, he hoped to be dancing with his founder and group section, um, group Scion, Delphine Arno, as evidenced by today's announcements. Louis Vuitton has continued to foster his relationship with the designer as he built his maverick and inclusive brand. Um, brands including Jean Paul Gaultier and AZ Factory have shifted towards a guest design model. Most recently, Lacoste announced he's moving the towards a collective approach. Yeah, you know what? Give Delane Lacoste. Lacoste actually suits him way better than flipping Louis Vuitton would, especially as a first dilliance into that field. Throwing him right in the deep end with LVMH, considering the stuff that he's done prior, makes no sense personally to me, especially considering who he's following. It's really, really a poison chalice. He would have fitted much better at Lacoste. But hey, what do I know? For Louis Vuitton, it's a philosophy that resonates with its late artistic director's practice. Prior to his death, Abel was working with LVMH to create a platform to launch new brands and form cutting edge partnerships with existing ones. The lane is an outsider to Paris fashion and might have been made a part of the appeal. And unlike and like Ablo, he has a streetwear background. No, the streetwear background, so guys are throwing it around like it's nothing. I don't know, man. I think this is horrendous personally. I think it might end up ending in tears. Obviously, you know, just as a kind of chancer and as somebody who people didn't really recommend or count out, you, I can't help but root for the guy. But from what I've seen so far, you know, people painting on the stage like Art Attack style and bursting through canvases and wearing up his dresses and stuff in some, you know, weird um, 21st, whatever, Gen Z version of flipping, you know, what flipping Alexander McQueen had done. I'm not really too sure if that's going to work personally for me. But hey, stranger things have happened. I just think it's a real disappointment and a real letdown after all the amazing names that Louis Vuitton were linked with, the Martin Rose, the Grace Wells Bonners. I keep mentioning that they went and chose this guy in the end. If anything, if you want to really have a change and really kind of reset everything and kind of take stuff in a new direction, actually go in a new direction and pick somebody completely different in terms of aesthetic in terms of design principles in terms of codes in terms of whatever else that they do and somebody like a kiko again like i said before doesn't necessarily have the greatest things to say about virgil from the time i remember you should check some of the stuff he used to post about the guy's designs and whatnot he would have been a probably a better introduction or a better person to put in that position but maybe who else knows maybe some of these guys don't want to work for louis vuitton don't want to work for bmh that could be also the factor right martin rose is a pretty popping brand why would she want to work under you know lvmh same goes for grace Wells bonner right she probably maybe is looking for investment looking to take the brand to the next level so doing all that stuff and also working for lvmh with your own brand you kind of get to a position where you're going to have to pick one or the other so maybe i can understand it from that point of view as well going forward you never actually know but i think this is incredibly underwhelming personally for me looking at it and disappointing to see considering with the names and everything going forward but you know these brands are going to do what they're going to do these brands are always going to do what they're going to do and i guess that's it for the action of english episode number 640 thanks so much for tuning in and being here with me hanging out if you are listening to this from the audio version of the show you will definitely hear my tune of the day playing in the background and suddenly hitting you at the end if you're watching this via the video portion of the show on youtube and whatnot you know what to do smash the like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below let me know what your thoughts feelings and suggestions are and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe and peace <laughs>